Good morning. So thus far, we've looked at um, a number of key points. To summarize what we've looked at thus far and where we are in the presentation of training one's mind, is the first stage is to recognize the equality between beings, that there really isn't any difference between us and others. We start by first recognizing with ourselves that all we want to experience is happiness. And we want this happiness to be um, everlasting, never punctuated by even a moment of pain or misery. And the state wherein uh, that is the state where that, that is marked by such an experience of lasting happiness never punctuated by pain or misery is the state of liberation and the state of enlightenment so how to achieve such a state then this is is presented in a number of steps of training but in order to be able to achieve the, uh, such a state one needs to both come to know well these stages of training and as one is coming to know them, train in them. So this word to train or, to, or this word for to practice, it literally means to gain experience of. So the way we understand this here is we gather knowledge and we train our mind in that knowledge. We gain experience of that knowledge. This is how we transform ourselves and we attain liberation or enlightenment. The first step then in the meditation is reflecting on this incredible opportunity we have with this life, 
but it is impermanent, it is going to end. Then following this uh, uh, reflection, we recognize at the end of this life, my continuum does not cease, rebirth is certain and it follows immediately. And when, when the time of my death comes, all that will help me in terms of attaining a good rebirth is not my friends and loved ones, nor all the possessions or my body that I've, I've cared for so in this life, but it's my virtue, my merit, my, my positive karma. This, 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 this then encourages us to use what remains of this life to accumulate virtue, to ensure that our future lives goes well. And then at this point, we remind ourselves of where we started in the meditation, that the situation I find myself in is not unique to me. Others are uh, in the same situation. Their life is ending. They do not recognize this. They live as if they have an expanse of time before them and with no thought to future lives. I now have recognized the need to accumulate virtue. And to the extent that I do so, I can have confidence my future lives will go well. Others are not in this situation. And here we can regenerate love for them, wanting them to spend what remains of their life accumulating the causes for happiness and attaining lasting happiness. And we generate compassion. May they be freed from all pain through eliminating the causes that would otherwise lead to suffering. We meditate further, having generated love and compassion, and we generate the altruistic attitude where we see it as our responsibility. It is not sufficient merely to yearn for others to abide in happiness. I need to guide them in how to do so. It is my responsibility. And so that's then the step of generating the altruistic attitude. And that is then again followed with a reflection on, of, on re realism, where we recognize that right now we lack the capacity to skillfully be able to guide others in a way that's perfectly in accordance with their own individual spiritual disposition, their own individual personality. So therefore, I need to become a far more skilled guide and I need to progress quickly to, the t to becoming a Buddha, a perfected being, a being that's completely eradicated all faults and, and, and um, perfected all good qualities. I need to become a Buddha so that I can guide others to a state of freedom. This is the generation of bodhicitta. And at this point, having reflected on the qualities of the Buddha, one goes for refuge. Refuge to the Buddha jewel, the founder, teacher, the perfected being who taught the, the stages that we are training in ourselves how, and the stages that will lead to the realization or the attainment of this same perfected state that he achieved. We generate faith in the, the Sangha Jewel, those are companions, our spiritual teachers who guide us in the cultivation of this path, who train us and guide us how to develop this path within, within ourselves. And in particular, our refuge towards the Dharma Jewel, the generation of true cessations and true paths in our continuum, which, which is what actually protects one from suffering. Having gone for refuge now, we then, in the meditation, engage, engage in meditating on the practices of a bodhisattva, starting with ethical restraint. So ethics is primarily restraining one's mind from coming under the, the influence of the afflictions and thereby restraining our uh, physical behavior from being non-virtuous and our verbal communication from being non-virtuous. Here, we make the commitment, I will not harm others through my physical verbal actions, nor even my way of thinking. And to help us develop such a, an approach, one can take vows. And guarding those vows well, one's mind starts to become subdued, restrained. In other words, not so influenced by the afflictions. Then the second training at this point from ethics is that of generosity. So whilst ethics is the determination not to harm, generosity is the determination to benefit. So these two will work together. 
Now in the meditation, we're focusing on the wish to give of ourselves. And this uh, giving of ourselves, the, the practice of generosity is training the mind in the wish to give. And one can uh, express this, whether materially or through uh, verbally uh, helping others or using our body to physically help others. So there's a wide way of helping, and it's generally presented as material generosity, the giving of fearlessness, so helping those who are in great, grave danger, or the giving of dharma, which would be to giving others uh, skillful advice to live an ethical life, to cultivate the causes for enlightenment, and so forth. So these are the stages of training that we've looked at thus far. And then a key point throughout all of these is that to, again this word for, for practice, to gain experience of the knowledge that we've gained requires repeated, uh, repeatedly re uh, gaining knowledge over an extensive period and repeatedly reflecting on that knowledge. And therefore, one uh, uh, strives to ensure that one has um, a daily meditation practice, even if it's of varying length, to every day to contemplate these points. And in here, I'm going to get 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 in here, so we need to get in here, so we need to get in here, so we need to get in here, Sengi Susulia, Neva Susi, Gunji, Jevina, Delia, Parsim Machupache, and Par Dusine, Parlain, two Denigi Dukjaj, Parlia, Sim Machupache, Par, Ben Dukjaj in the Len Malobache, and the Chick Sim Machupache, and then Sevasi or Sevin Yamlin, and Dinashi, the Anzugi, Chicke, Chuin Yamlin Chidine, and the Ganga Tigua, just a dinner, all that Ganga, Shatechi to some other Shah Majavache, Telia, and Ganga to Nakanga, Rias and Big Sim Motu, which you can see, Sim Bapa, which you do to watch Google, yes, it is under Sweeping Yamlin Google, yes, it is a dinner, and the Dushine, Sweeping Yamlin Jaworia. The training that follows that of ethics and generosity is the training of patience. Patience is an indispensable quality to develop within our mind. It's, whilst ethics is the determination not to, to, to harm through restraining one's mind from afflictions, generosity is the determination to give of oneself. Patience is a mind that stays undisturbed in the face of adversity. So being patient refers to one's mind not being disturbed no matter what one encounters. So the source of disturbance would be threefold, either from the external world, in particular from other people, but a material world too, that's one. Secondly, our in, inner world, our way of thinking. And thirdly, when practicing the Dharma, in that one encounters many hardships in practicing the Dharma. So whatever source of adversity one encounters, the practice of patience is similar in that it is marked by a mind that is not disturbed by the adversity no matter where it is arising from. And the visible res result of a patient mind is that one will not respond in a harmful manner, whether physically, verbally or, or mentally. That is the, the, the response of a patient mind. But the practice of patience is if the successful practice of patience is no matter what one is encountering, one's mind stays undisturbed. The next practice is that of joyous perseverance. The term in, in the title, Joyous Perseverance, a joy refers to taking delight in virtuous activities of any kind. So, for example, 
in this particular meditation practice, taking delight in being able to meditate in this way. And the, the, the function of delight is that one will persevere with ease in virtuous practices. One will not be overcome by laziness or procrastination because of taking delight in virtue. And this serves, as we've heard throughout the trainings, that it's indispensable to engage in these repeatedly over a sustained period in order to bring the attainment of enlightenment ever closer. Joyous perseverance adds to our strength of mind, our determination, due to us taking delight in re repeatedly receiving teachings, repeatedly reflecting on them. So therefore, joyous perseverance adds to our strength of mind in, in cultivating virtue. ที่เราเชื่อได้เลยอย่างนั้นคือแต่เงี้ยลุงอายุสมัยก่อนเนี่ยเชื่อเลยดูไปจะว่าจะว่ากันจริงไหมเส้นไปกี่สัมปทานเ
one will readily form close and harmonious relationships with others. One will easily get on with, 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 with others and will have warm and close connections with others. So this is the way to understand the, uh, the literal presentation of one will be handsome or beautiful, one will be pleasing to look at. It means one will readily form close relationships with others and have harmonious friendships with others. And the ripening result from joyous perseverance is that through this virtue that we've accumulated, through delighting in virtue, that will ripen in one seeking out uh, uh, the, the teachings for spiritual development. And one will, will yearn for them, long for them. When one meets them, one, a delight will arise in one's mind and one will readily apply oneself. And in this way, one will uh, rapidly continue one's uh, path of spiritual development. Moreover, with a personality that delights in virtue implies that one will not delight in non-virtue. Therefore, one will have a personality that is naturally inclined to virtue and will be naturally kind-hearted, a good person. So these results that I mentioned, these are the smallest level of result that comes for the practitioner who's just focused on a good rebirth. However, should one have developed a far more powerful motivation such as bodhicitta, those same results will still be uh, achieved, but one will consider them, uh, well, they can be considered as a side effect. They will still be achieved, but the primary uh, strength of this virtue continues until the attainment of enlightenment. This virtue continues to have strength and energy leading to the attainment of enlightenment. <laughs> Jesus Chile 
There are also additional trainings to engage in. The next is that of concentration or calm abiding, which is a mind that is single-pointedly concentrated on its object of virtue. You all have experience of meditation, and I'm sure you all have the same experience, that one sits down, tries to engage in meditation, and almost immediately one is distracted. You bring your mind back to whatever it is one's uh, thinking about, and again, almost immediately, one is distracted. And this continues. As we slowly, over time, our mind becomes ever more concentrated, it becomes proportionately less distracted. And whilst this is welcome, the mind remains easily distracted. And the result of this is that the virtue that we accumulate, whilst indispensable and what we're striving to accumulate, it is so weak. Here the analogy is if we think of a wide, wide river, the water is flowing, but standing on the river bank, one can hardly see the movement of water. This is likened to our current mind. It's very weak. So therefore, the, res the resulting virtue from all our endeavors is weak. But when single points of concentration, calm abiding has been developed, then one's mind is completely free of distraction. It's an incredibly powerful mind. As long as one uh, wants, one can meditate on a single topic without distraction. So you as a meditator, choose the duration, 15 minutes, 5 hours, and you meditate single-pointedly on that one topic, and thereby but this mind is clearly so much more powerful because it's not disturbed by distraction, and therefore the merit that is accumulated is so much more powerful. And this then is likened to that same broad river when it reaches um, a ravine and now becomes very narrow. That same river becomes a torrent of water gushing through that ravine. So much more powerful. This then is achieved through the development of single-pointed concentration. And it serves to ensure that the, the same amount of time in meditation produces so much more merit and therefore speeds our spiritual developments. <laughs> え、ニョモンバダディディ Dukin the sixth practice, we started with ethics, generosity, patience, joyous perseverance, concentration. Now the sixth, that of wisdom. 
the practice of wisdom itself, that consciousness can be understood in many ways, or the many different levels of, of wisdom, here it specifically refers to the wisdom realizing selflessness or the wisdom realizing emptiness, the specific type of wisdom. All these other trainings we've looked at to now lead to the accumulation of merit. Here, when we come to wisdom, we talk about an accumulation of wisdom. So it's in a category of its own. Here, earlier we spoke about that the cause of our suffering and the cause of non-virtue are our afflicted minds. But all our afflictions, whether anger or attachment or pride, they have at their very root ignorance. And again, amongst the different kinds of ignorance, specifically can, um, can be called either the ignorance of self-grasping or the ignorance of true grasping. This is the root cause from which all our afflictions and thereby non-virtue follows. So through engaging in the accumulation of merit, so those, all, those five prior trainings from ethics up to concentration, the way that they counteract the afflictions is we can understand if you have a weed in your garden and you cut that weed, that weed's not going to bother you. You've maybe cut it right at the soil, can't see it. Now you can have peace. Your garden looks lovely again. But the root is there. It will grow again. And then once again, one cuts it at the level of the soil, can't see it, and one's day is once again pleasant. So that is the way the um, other trainings that are included in accumulation of merit impact on, on the afflictions, the weeds of the afflictions. They temporarily overwhelm them. They temporarily suppress them. But the root remains. Because the root is ignorance, and those other trainings have not counted the ignorance, only the wisdom realizing selflessness or the wisdom realizing emptiness is what eradicates that ignorance. And by eradicating the ignorance in the analogy, it is likened to pulling the weed out by its root. Then it will never grow again. In other words, by eradicating ignorance, all the other afflictions will never grow. So therefore, what we really need to counteract and eradicate is true grasping or the ignorance of true grasping. And it's done through developing the contrary mind, the wisdom realizing emptiness or the wisdom realizing selflessness. Dinashin Shang that all, all phenomena can be divided into two, that which is impermanent, it changes momentarily, and that which is permanent, which is unchanging. Buddha Shakyamuni taught that this far larger class of impermanent phenomena ar arise independent on causes. Everything that is, exists, that is impermanent, arises independent on causes. That small category of phenomena that is permanent or unchanging, that does not change momentarily, 
These do not come about in dependence on causes, but yet they are interdependent. Therefore, Buddha Shakyamuni taught, everything that exists is dependent. Those which are impermanent, they are dependent on causes. Those which are, are permanent are or unchanging, they are interdependent. Therefore, everything that exists, exists dependently, arises dependently. The illustration, the very simple illustration the text always presents, is a sprout has come about in dependence on its seed. So therefore, the sprout, the result, came about in dependence on its cause. Nothing that exists, exists independently. Everything that exists is dependent. Here, this term everything has been emphasized because everything that exists is not independent, but dependent. For example, the attainment of the, uh, the state of a Buddha, of enlightenment, has come about in dependence on causes. Namely, the paths, the mental paths that are cultivated. Each of those paths have come about in dependence on causes and so forth. Everything that exists is dependent, arises dependently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dusche Sitting, sitting quietly, you think of your sense of self-identity. What comes to mind is a sense of self that is separate from our aggregates. So our aggregates refer to our physical aggregate, our body, and our mental aggregates, various consciousnesses. So we, that our sense of self appears to be something apart from, separate from our body and mind. So this sense of self that appears to be independent of our body and mind, this appears to us, and here comes a technical term, to be truly existent, which means it appears to exist in the way that it appears. So it appears, our sense of self appears as if it is independent of our body and mind, and it appears to us as if it exists in that way, that it appears as independent. But it's not, there's not just this mere appearance of ourself, we believe that it exists in this way. So there's a consciousness that believes that it exists in this way, and it grasps at this appearance as being valid, as being in, uh, uh, authentic or correct. <coughs> So this is called the, the grasping at true existence. So the, the self appears to exist independently. So that's an appearance of true existence. And then consciousness grasps at it as existing in the way that it appears independently, truly. That is the grasping at true existence. And it's this grasping that needs to be eradicated. Ah, that didn't I see? I'm just getting by now. I see, 
这些都是三大的，啊，这个都是三大的。这里绿的，三，看来也没得吧？过，人工工业，这边就没办法吃。这是俺现在的，俺做绿的，三，刚入去泡泡绿，大把子米，绿大把的，这里有的吧？没得，
will be severed. In other words, the afflictions which all arise from ignorance, anger, attachment, pride and so forth, cannot arise. The root cause is gone. With no afflictions, one will not accumulate any non-virtuous karma, and therefore one will not create any causes to be born in the lower realms, and will rather attain a state of lasting happiness, a state where because ignorance have, has been severed, no afflictions can arise, which means the mind is never afflicted again, or will never be afflicted again, or to use synonyms, will never be deluded again, which means the mind abides in lasting happiness that will never be punctuated by the suffering of the afflictions.这个公路里啊,但是让下的几个人生生命太有生命他们就,嗯,讲话的点过度生命,你讲话的生命他们就懂话的照顾的生命,你讲话的生命他们就懂话的照顾的生命,你讲话的生命他们就懂话的照顾
reflected that even if I achieve a good rebirth in my next life, in that life, just like now, I will face the danger of falling into the lower realms. Until I'm liberated from samsara in its entirety, I will always face that danger. I have to become liberated from samsara in its entirety. And with such a motivation, engaging in the exact same meditations, one will be accumulating causes that will lead to liberation. But in particular, if one engages in the meditation, reflecting on the preciousness of this life, death and impermanence, and then taking that step that I mentioned of meditating on love, compassion, and in particular these two, of um, the altruistic attitude and bodhicitta itself, here one gives rise to the determination to become a Buddha for the sake of others. And if one then continues in the meditation, all of this virtue then becomes causes for enlightenment. So that is then used, engaging in the same meditations by creating the causes for the greatest of results. Now, for those who are only interested in attaining a good rebirth, their primary meditations will be those of ethics, of um, generosity, of patience, and joyous perseverance. These are the four indispensable causes to attain not only a re rebirth as a human or God, but also to be marked with all the favorable conditions to be able to continue one's spiritual development. But should one want to attain liberation and enlightenment, then one has to also meditate on concentration and wisdom, because to progress to liberation, one has to develop the wisdom realizing emptiness, which is what severs the afflictions and leads to, uh, severs the uh, ignorance and thereby all the afflictions and leads to the attainment of liberation. And for one's wisdom to have sufficient strength to, to do that, it needs to be conjoined with concentration, a single point of concentration. But if one desires to become the most skilled of guides for the sake of others, then one has to, one's wisdom has to be conjoined with bodhicitta. Only then, when one's wisdom is conjoined with both bodhicitta and concentration, will that wisdom have sufficient strength to lead to the attainment of enlightenment. And moreover, all one's virtuous practices, if conjoined with bodhicitta, will have sufficient strength to enable the attainment of enlightenment. And for all these practices of, of um, ethics up to wisdom, for one to engage in them with sufficient vigor for them to have a truly transformative impact, the foundation, uh, foundational meditations that were mentioned at the outset of the text, death and impermanence and so forth, are indispensable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now let's uh, turn to the text, to the eighth verse. Your body and mind, both now and in the future, are particularly harmed by drunkenness, which is viewed with contempt by the wise. Therefore, you are fine features. It would be welcome if you were to, complete, to turn completely from such despised behavior. Then Sebaran 
这些人都是在这些人都是在这些人都是在这些人都是在这些人都是在这些人都是在这些人都是在这些人都是在这些人都是在这些人都是在这些人都是在这些人都是在这些人都是在这些人都是在这些人都是在这些人都是在这些人都
Tenigi, Tambanam, ye tatin, Yahoo, Mare, said, maybe he need, eh? And you can't delay ten to loan a leg, said him. Then thou, you know, tung meva, that in a tung meva, and a madonna Yahoo, said. Kissing your mother, there's a tungu of in a that's who pass bung or the shin, loan a less than as pardon, so low leva cigarua. Just that didn't loan a leg, said you. That's our guinea, your mother's tungu and the part zam shache, thou again, madon was she doing a Yahoo, said. The verse concludes, Therefore, you are fine features. It would be welcome if you were to turn completely from such despised behavior. So we had this term, uh, you are fine features, earlier in the text. Here it's referring to you who have an aspiration to practice, with the meaning of the word practice, to gain experience of your knowledge. So you have an, you have an aspiration to spiritually develop, to transform your mind. It would be welcome if you were to turn completely from such a despised behavior. So here the aspiration is expressed for those of you who are spiritual aspirants, who have the desire to transform your, your, your minds. If you uh, do uh, currently consume alcohol, to turn away from it completely, to completely abandon it, would be best. And in the other day, Gala, JB, Pusu, Dungana, Chalu, Devarna, Demijas, Dugan, JB, Kase, Yule, Nam, Gunji, Pongar, Jeva, Matongams. And the ninth verse Whatever conduct eventually leads to suffering, even if at first glance it appears to be pleasurable, do not do it. After all, is it not understood that deliciously cooked food which is mixed with poison is to be thoroughly discarded? Na then Looking first at the first two lines, whatever conduct eventually leads to suffering, even if at first glance it appears to be pleasurable, do not do it. So following on from the previous verse, it's clear that... Um, Consumption of alcohol is referred to, but we can take this far broader in that when one is um, faced with the possibility to engage in something that one ta- finds pleasurable, whether it's alcohol or drugs or any kind of intoxicant or even um, a, a particular food that one enjoys, whatever um, it may be, the way a, a spiritual aspirant should approach this is with a wide and expansive mind, a mind that is far-sighted, not looking at just at the immediate sense gratification, but thinking beyond this, thinking in a broader way, more expansive way, a more far-sighted way. What are the outcomes of engaging in this behavior, whatever it may be, that I consider pleasurable? Using that as um, a basis to make a decision as to whether to engage or not. And do not JP, Kazi, Yule, Nam, Gunji, Pora, Cheva, Matongam, City, Tisna, Dangan, Zuki, Duda, Duki, Deniki, Tepa, Dabship, Kalana, Duglu, Shape, Dene, Kala, Yule, said the Kazi, Yule, said the Kala, Sucha, Basiurua, Yule, Deni, Sucha, Vadiki, Pa, Sana, Saduka, Shimbu, Yubada, Bata, Dana, Ninja, Worshi, Patana, Ninja, Saduka, Shimbu, Yubayne, Dukdang, Dukdang, Jesu, Yuendi, 
And then, when you pour a cheva, Matan, Chasang and Segumati, or the Massa, Massa and Pangu to us, the Pamat Tungu to us, Chisanti, Persian and Zago and Marzina, this up and that the Ninjibo, the Shimbora Jungor, the Puglia, Lugor, Nova is a Haku in the Segumin to us, Pitin Nashin, and that the Jake, Puglia, Neki, Changata, Simani, Rita, Jesu Chasa, Pishitaki or Mares, Tisuchibares or And this is illustrated in the next two lines with an, 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 an analogy or an, an, an illustration. After all, is it not understood that deliciously cooked food, which is mixed with poison, is to be thoroughly discarded? What, what is being referred to here is that we need to uh, take what we already know to be true, which is that our sense pleasures can deceive us. And we need to rely on this, this knowledge and rely on a more expansive wisdom that is looking beyond the immediate pleasures of the senses and rather do what is beneficial over the long term. So this was a point that was made at the beginning of this text of looking beyond the immediate gratification to throughout this life, beyond this life. And here this is in relation to how the our sense pleasures so readily deceive us. And the name is a dang around to get Chidan and around to get Milia, Chicke, Chicke Supo, Tetanata, and this Chicke, Semitica, Sem Tempa Timbota, and Chicke Suine, Tetanachi, Manzul Kubor, Wada, the name is a Denego and the Denigi, you are the Penny Chang Roj Mango Tumba and Digi Carson, Sem Tempa Timbu Mabachata, Matemba. Chaya, and the Jen and the D. Kinch and the Mangu Tumba and the Digi Kinch and Supul Nazarada, the Nigi Zubutana Tambu Meda, and then Azuki and Yamla Chevene, Yamla Yakuchi, Tuagi, Yomare, and Dimin Bigi, and Shelly, Rochi or some Bene, Susubutana Mena, Rochi, Tuya, Meva, Yungo, Mevanza, the Nigi Mayagi, Yelia, and Dambo, Damboni, D. Kin, Gudi Kipa, Ka, or Tembu, or just the Nigi, Changatoya, the Similata. Pusu that in Neka Shimbur Yawashi Tombo in a Pusu and Luda, Sim Nigal, Negi, Rixina, Disubishita, your mother, Sam Shawares, Nema Bishta Veneta, Patsam Shawares, Nema Bishta Men, Pe Yashur de Nu, Tinit, Tene, Lalenta, your mares, Lavardo, Major Chang of Tombo in the Digi, Sim Chiden, Chang Dongu, Sim Tambatim Mabaja, Tene, and the Sikanaba Million, Negi Sigmong Bulagrias. Dilabna all need to have a comfortable and healthy body, as well as um, exper- a, a, a mind that is happy too. So we require a level of comfort and pleasure in order, in order to live well. So here, what these verses are encouraging us to do is to think for ourselves, to rely on our intelligence or our wisdom, to rely on our intelligence rather than our desire for the pleasures of the senses. And the way, the way to do this is, maybe we could say, not through merely relying on self-discipline, but through primarily relying on our intelligence, through thinking about the ramifications of the decisions we make. So whether it's relating to um, health concerns, from eating uh, the wrong kinds of food for, for our, our, our particular bodies or drinking too much, think about that. And that, uh, uh, we think about it well enough that intelligence will be able to guide us to turn away from something we find pleasurable. We also then take the knowledge we have of the Dharma, thinking about the impact that um, engaging in certain behaviors has in t- on our mind and therefore, in terms of the resulting actions that we engage in, harm that will follow, negative karma that's accumulated, 
and the ramifications, therefore, that will be experienced in future lives. So here, one is being encouraged to develop one's intelligence, use one's wisdom, and in that way, let go of behavior that whilst one finds pleasurable, seeing that pleasure as being a, a delusion, in that it is obscuring the reality of the situation, and rather follow our intelligence, knowing that, knowing with confidence that desired results will come from this path of intelligence, seeing that as the path of pleasure, rather than um, in, in engaging or over-engaging in um, the, the pleasures of the senses. Well, thank you then. We'll conclude for, for our morning there. Thank you very much. <laughs>